Are you guys ready to see our brand new food storage edition? Come on. This room has been a long time coming. In fact, if you've been watching any of our videos, you probably saw last year where we were adding this part onto the house and you saw framing, but you never actually saw the finished room in a proper tour until today. I have to say of all the projects we've done around the homestead and onto the house, this was the one I feel like I have waited for the longest and I still get very happy every time I come into this room. So we've got our regular kitchen and front pantry area, and that's all fabulous. But when you are growing and preserving a year's worth of food for a lot of your food items, we ran out of space in the kitchen. I had things underneath the bed, pretty much any place that you could find to stash extra food. We were taking advantage of it but I was really excited when we finally got this room in because I can easily walk in. Now, I know you may be looking at this and you might be thinking, well, that doesn't really look like an entire year's worth of food. You would be correct because this is just one of our storage areas. So this is what I call our back pantry. So when we run out of these items in our kitchen and just the regular cupboards and the pantry space in there, this is where we come shopping from and this is our back stock. So this set of shelving here is predominantly store-bought food items, which is pretty obvious by looking at it. I do, however, hang our homegrown garlic. So I've got the braids here of garlic. Uh, those get hung from there. And I also use the top part of it for our different canning jars, uh, lids for the canning lids and some of that. But this is predominantly mostly store-bought food. This backspace, this is our home canned food. And you actually see some sections here that are empty jars and turned upside down because predominantly most of my canning happens in the summer months. So usually July through about September is when all of our warm weather crops are coming on and I'm doing all of our canning. And at the time of this filming, we're in February, which means it's been half a year since I've been canning. So a lot of these food items when you see the upside down jars like this, we have used them and then I just put the jars back here to be filled this next growing season. Uh, but we've got uh, smoked salmon, which is one of our favorite things to have on the shelf and ready to go. Pickles, relishes, vegetable soup, bruschetta in a jar. Oh, you guys, this is just like summer in a jar. It is so good. It's one of my favorite recipes and it's in my book, Everything Worth Preserving. We've got some uh, vanilla extract, and then this is my bigger jar of vanilla extract here. And these shelves I love. So these are, you see they just slide in here and these are extra. And so these are what I've been using for our root cellar type storage. Of course, this is not a root cellar. This is up high. This room doesn't have any direct light. Right now I've got all the doors and all the lights on open, so it's actually bright enough so that you can see while we're filming in here. But for most of the time, this room is dark, which is what you need. Cool and dark is ideal for your long-term food storage. Now, these onions actually came from Azure Standard, and Azure is a sponsor of this video because my onion crop, I'm gonna show you, these are from Azure. I buy them in bulk and then I just leave them up here so I can come and grab them and they'll store at room temperature very well. This is my onion crop. My onion crop was pitiful this year. It was a combination of a really wet and cold spring all the way into July. I mean, we had days where it was 50 degrees Fahrenheit was the high in June here and just tons and tons of rain. So they really got stunted because it was so cold. Even though onions are a cool weather crop, they really need a little bit warmer temperatures than 50 degrees to grow. And then it was like you flipped a switch and we went and had the most days over 90 degrees Fahrenheit that we had recorded in summer. And that lasted oddly all the way through October. So we had the coldest and wettest and then the hottest and driest summers on record in like over 50 years all in the same year. And the onions really suffered. I mean, you can see like I did get an onion harvest and these are fine. This is what's left, but 
they weren't very large. So I've just been using these more like as pearl onions, like if I'm making a soup or a stew or something like that. So I have a few, a few of those left. This year we're going to, to hope and rectify the onion harvest. So definitely supplemented from Azure Standard. And I've got over here, this is some of our winter squash. So onions, garlic, and your winter squash, they will all store really well. Now the pumpkins already have went bad by this late. Pumpkins for me only usually store, usually around through Christmas, maybe the first part of January, and then that's about as long as I can get them to store um, root cellar wise without being down in the root cellar. But these guys have done really well. So I've got um, Long Island cheese, and then this is different delicata squash. You can see these are doing great. Um, and these I have last usually clear through, well, either until we eat them all, or I've had them go almost all the way to June, which is almost an entire year, not quite, because I usually am harvesting the winter squash here in September and October. But this is great because it just adds nice little extra storage space. And then here, this is all of our freeze-dried foods. So I've got predominantly in the jars here, that's all freeze-dried, a lot of fruit, um, homemade hot chocolate, which I've got a recipe and video on that one if you wanna check that out. One of the things I've been really excited about is I freeze-dried all of our broccoli and cauliflower harvest from last year. And then the homemade instant mashed potatoes. So you've probably seen the video, if not, we'll make sure and, and link that so you can go and check that out where I leave our potatoes in the ground and I overwinter them in the ground with straw and mulch all the way through until about April. Once we hit April, our ground temperature starts to warm up so much that any potatoes that we haven't dug up, they will begin to sprout and or rot, but that means they're not really at eating, eating places anymore. So I will dig up what's left in the garden in March and then those need to be preserved, what I'm not gonna keep for our seed potatoes to replant with, because I just reuse what we've got. So I made these as regular mashed potatoes, left the skins on, they are German butterball, so they have a really thin skin anyways. German butterball are my absolute favorite. They store well, awesome flavor. They work great for mashed potatoes, potato salad, roasted potatoes, just, they're my favorite potato. The key is though, I freeze dried these. And so when you're gonna be freeze drying them, you just make regular mashed potatoes, but you don't add butter and milk. So you're just gonna add just enough water to get them to be mashed up. And then I put them in the trays, which these are my freeze dried trays right here. So I just put them in the tray, just right below the lip, and then freeze dried them till they were completely freeze dried. And then took those out, put them through the food processor, powdered them, and so these are the mashed potatoes. So then when we go to use these, just like you would buy store-bought instant mashed potatoes, you're just going to boil water, put this in, and then add your butter and your milk at that time. Now you can freeze dry things like ice cream and things that have a little bit of dairy and fat in them, but if you get too much fat for your freeze dryer, then it can be rancid and, and have issues. So I chose so that these would have a longer shelf life, not to add the butter or the dairy until time of reconstitution, but I have to tell you, I have loved having these on hand and knowing that they were from our garden, exactly what's in them, but they've been great on fast nights or when we have a lot of snow, that's the only caveat to storing your potatoes in the ground is if you get a whole bunch of snow, you don't wanna go and dig through the snow in order to get to the potatoes. So these are what I use when we need potatoes and there's a lot of snow on the ground. This of course is the freeze dryer and we have went back and forth on keeping the freeze dryer in this room because it does take up a significant amount of space. And when you run the freeze dryer, this is a 10 by 10 room. Um, it does raise the temperature anywhere from about five to 10 degrees. So in August in the summer months, it heated it up so much that I was not using the freeze dryer in August because it would just get too hot. However, the rest of the year, this room is farthest away from our wood stove, so it doesn't really get a lot of heat. So when it's really cold out, instead of trying to heat this room, then I could put things in the freeze jar and it works really good. It does limit us though on the amount of food that we can store in the shelves. Um, I think I'm gonna end up putting one more shelf here. I wasn't quite sure when we built it, but I think I'm gonna go ahead and add another shelf, maybe wrap it around a little bit. I have to make sure that I have enough clearance though for airflow for running this. 
So we've thought about moving it back out to the she shed, but I kind of like that it warms it up here the rest of the year because I'm like, August is one month out of the year where it's too warm, but then I've got pretty much 11 months out of the year here where it heats the room and actually keeps it at a great temperature, but it is kind of a space hog. So I keep going back and forth. I'm not sure yet if we're gonna leave it in here as is or end up moving it back out. But this is also a great storage area underneath here where I can keep a lot of things. And that is one of the things that I wanted to share with you today is long-term storage of flour and sugar and some of your other items. So this is a five gallon food safe bucket that was completely clean when I brought it in here. And now I have a piece of, oh, I think it was when I was showing you my onions. I got some onion skin in there. So this is a five gallon food safe bucket and I like to use the gamma lids. And I got these from Azure Standard, who I said is our sponsor. I also happen to get my big 50 pound bag of flour from Azure Standard as well. So they carry in bulk. I get a lot of the things that we're not growing here on the homestead, I get from them. And we have for first time new customer of a $50 order or more, a coupon code that will get you 10% off. So it's pioneering today. We'll make sure that we put the link and the coupon code beneath this video for you. But I get a lot of not only my food, but a lot of my food storage supplies from them as well. So these gamma lids are great because they are airtight. They're easy for you to get in and out of when you need to get into these and they keep everything sealed up nicely. So it's a two piece lid system. And we first have to take this ring we're gonna put the ring on the bucket here. There we go. So you're gonna snap that on, and then we're gonna fill this with the content. So I'm actually transferring this bag of flour. You know, flour has a shelf life. It will go rancid. Um, usually a year, two years max, if you've kept it in a really cool, um, airtight environment, etc. So this bag I bought knowing that we would go through it within a year. However, when it arrived to me, which can happen, you can see where there's a little hole in the bag here. So I'm not gonna leave it in this bag because one, it can get air and bugs and anything else could get in there. So I'm gonna go ahead and put it in to this bucket and we're gonna transfer it. But what's really great is using these buckets, if you're looking for really long-term food storage, we will link to the video that I did on foods that will last 10 years or more. You're gonna wanna be looking at actually getting wheat berries. They'll last 20 plus years, and I store those in these types of buckets as well. Now, I have to say, I'm not really too concerned about pantry moths. Um, a lot of times people, you can get pantry moths and the eggs come in on your different grains, can be in your flour, especially your wheat berries, and then they'll hatch. And as you can imagine, they hatch and then they eat everything and they just create a really big mess. Living here, I don't know anybody who's ever got them. I don't know if it's because we are just so much cooler than the rest of the country for most of the year. It's never been something that I've ever had to deal with. However, if it's something where you live, then you may wanna take your flour and any of your grains when they come in and put them in the deep freezer for three days then take them out and let it come to room temperature for a week. And then some people recommend refreezing them again, just in case anything has hatched and laid eggs to catch the full cycle. And then after you do that, then transfer them to something like this for your long-term storage. So this is a five gallon food safe bucket. And as I said, this is 50 pounds of flour. So I'm gonna have to use two buckets to store this whole bag of flour. So we've got that in there. We'll see how, how well I can do without having flour all over the floor. I'm still probably gonna have to sweep. Here we go. So this is one of my favorite flowers. It's an organic unbleached. So if I am using an all-purpose store-bought flour instead of grinding my own, this is one of my favorite brands to use. I've always had really good success with it. So now we're just gonna go ahead and put this lid on and you're just gonna line that up. It's got arrows that show you how to close or open it and you just spin that down. So this is great because as I said, it will keep bugs out and it would also keep, if you did have a hatch of anything, it would keep the bugs in so that it wouldn't spread and transfer to the rest of the food in your pantry. 
And this is airtight, which is great for that longer term storage. And it's so easy, it, it can be really hard. I don't know if I'm the only one, but ladies, if you have trouble getting lids off of things. Now, normally for my buckets, I finally broke down and just bought one of these, but you still have to pry them off and it can kind of get to be a pain. So I like these lids because when I need to get into this, all I have to do is just screw it open and then away we go. So I'll get my other one filled of these and then hide those back in here. I have to say, I do like having it feel somewhat neat and tidy. For some of the other storage containers, I actually get these from Azure as well. So these are the one gallon glass jars. So I've got um, extra sugar in here. These are the two gallon ones. So in here I've got my uh, masa flour and some more sugar. And then again, these are the one gallon jars and I keep my popcorn in these ones. And so I get all of those from Azure. And here is a great tip. I buy my coconut oil in the glass. This is a half gallon jar. So after you're done using this, I just take some um, almost boiling water, water just off the, off the boil and pour it inside so that you get any of the you know, oily residue that's still in there because it's coconut oil. And then wipe that out really good with a paper towel because you don't want to put any of that down your drains. And then wash it again in hot soapy water. And then you've got half gallon glass jars with the lid. These works excellent for ferments as well as even kind of smaller dry food storage. But that way you are getting your food and then a really nice reusable container. So that's how I've been trying to order all of the coconut oil when I found out that I could actually order my coconut oil from Azure in these glass jars. If you want to learn more about foods that store and how to do so long term, check out this video.